Well, we have an absolute treat this morning uh, in Grace Chapel in this house, and we have been talking about this for several months now and uh, getting you ready for it. We're going to be discussing the issue of human sexuality in our culture and how to take a biblical and loving stance towards that. You have asked for it for the last year, and we thought there would be no better person to help us do that, and he's no stranger to the Grace Chapel family. He's been here several times over the years, and I told our young adults on Friday night that when I was 19 is when I first learned about Dr. Michael Brown, and ever since then, through Ask Dr. Brown, his radio shows and Facebook and articles that he's written and the books that he's written, he's blessed my life abundantly, and I know today he will continue to do that for you, and so we're just incredibly, incredibly blessed to have Dr. Michael Brown with us this morning. Would you welcome him to the stage? God bless you, buddy. Give you a hug. Appreciate it. Love you, man. Thank you. Love you. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. It is wonderful to be with all of you. And when I received the invitation to come and speak on this, well, really, whenever I receive an invitation to be here, I don't pray about it. I just say, of course, with joy. Uh, but thank you for being who you are. What a wonderful spirit of worship is here. And as I get to spend time with pastors and elders and leaders, they, they really care about the flock here. They care about you and want to see you thrive in God. Uh, so glad to be here with you, everyone watching online. Great to be with you. Hey, I want to give a shout out to a very special group of people that may not get all the attention they need because they do things so well that you forget about them. But how about a shout out to the media team? Come on. You know, I've, I've had churches where I minister and they'll ask me like a month in advance, they'll contact my assistant, could you give us your message title and sermon notes? And I, I got saved in a church where it was, it was very kind of old-fashioned Pentecostal, and it was an unwritten rule that if you were anointed to preach, you didn't use notes when you preached. <laughs> so literally, that's how we all started. In fact, yesterday, the 21st, was the 48th anniversary of my first sermon at the age of 18. <laughs> so uh, I learned to preach like that, just spontaneously getting a message, and of course, I had a lot of the word memorized and things in my head. And that's been my pattern for decades. I mean, I've taught whole seminary classes of 30 hours in a week and apologize that I have no notes because it's just kind of organized in my head. And so when I, it's no problem for me literally to be walking up to the pulpit and I still don't know what the message is. And I know it'll drop in my heart and it'll be clear. The crisis I get is when I'm asked to give notes in advance. <laughs> so I worked that through. I said, okay, the same God that gives me a message on the spot can give me a message a month earlier. And then putting notes together, but I, I wanted to put a lot of things in PowerPoint for you. Uh, did on Friday night, sent it into the team with video and picture, and they, they did everything great. And, and then I wanted to revise things for this morning, so it's, it's late afternoon Saturday that I sent everything over. So I mean, you may not get emails opened, or by the time they open them, it's too late, but I came in, I had everything ready, so my appreciation to them for doing things so smoothly. I had a theory years ago that the, the audio people, because they never get appreciation, that every so often they sabotage the mic. And then they scramble, they fix it, and everyone appreciates them. So show appreciation for things that work well as opposed to waiting for them to break down, all right? So um, today, in, in the two services, the messages are gonna overlap, but one is gonna emphasize one point more than the other, and then the second will, will do the other. So you may actually wanna take in both services later on, if, uh, get the message from the second service, and folks at the second, I'll encourage them to, to check out the first. But just wanna mention the resources we have that tie in with the message and then we'll open the scriptures. Uh, Can You Be Gay and Christian is, will really get to the hard issues, give you insight into those who struggle with same-sex attraction, 
and, 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 and help you to reach them with the truth of scripture and really open up the word on this. And then outlasting the gay revolution, uh, what's happening in the society and the biblical principles that we live by that will bring about positive change. So these two books will be available. In fact, I'll run out right after the service to do a book signing. And my most recent book uh, is called Has God Failed You? Finding Faith When You're Not Even Sure God Is Real. So that's just independent, came out. I think you find it helpful. But I have a couple of chapters in this that deal with the question, is the Bible outdated? Is it a bigoted book? Does God hate gays? So, so that's in this book, there's overlap. And if you get any two of the books, there's a debate I did a few years back. Actually, I look a little different. I'm a bit bigger then. And, um, but you'll see it's a few years back, a debate I did with my friend Rabbi Shmuley on uh, is homosexuality America's greatest moral crisis. It's a real eye-opener, fascinating debate. So that's there at the table as well. Let me just pass this over here. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. And then uh, let's pray together. Thank you, Father. Abba, we look to you, we love you, we honor you. We ask you for your heart, for your mind. Give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, as the Jewish religious leaders come to Jesus asking him to weigh in on a dispute about divorce. And they're obviously trying to catch him in, in his answer. And there were two different camps of the Pharisees that had different views. So they're saying, well, where do you stand on this? Where do you stand? And in the midst of his answer about divorce, he tells us something very profound about God's design and plan for human sexuality. So verse 1, when Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? That was what one of the camps held to. And, and how does he answer? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. There's a design, there's a, a purpose. He's quoting from Genesis chapter one. And he said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And then he goes on to discuss, well, then, why did Moses even give any laws for divorce? And Jesus explains it was because of the hardness of human heart, but that was never God's intent. There is something very careful in how God created us and how he knitted us together. Do you realize that conception, we have our DNA, this, this incredibly detailed code that if, if you read one letter of the code per second, it would, it would take you almost 100 years to read. Coded and made with, with thousands of markers, marking out male, marking out female. And just the way he designed us with specific purpose to be fruitful and multiply. And if you've ever done puzzles and you're trying to find the right piece that, that fits together, well, the man was made for the woman and the woman was made for the man. In many, many unique ways. Spiritually, emotionally, socially, biologically. And when we deviate from his design and from his plan, everything gets terribly messed up. It's not, it's not bigotry, it's not hatred to say that, but things get terribly messed up. Even if you just think of human flourishing. I was chatting with a pastor in, in California one day and he said, yeah, he's tried to illustrate this with his kids. So let, let's say you take an island, deserted island, it's got everything you need in terms of potential wildlife and crops and things like that. It's a deserted island and you put 10 gay couples there. Five gay men, five lesbian women, excuse me, make 10 of each. And they are, they love each other. They care about each other. They're devoted to each other for life. If you come back there 100 years later, there's nothing left. There's no people. 
Why? They may have loved each other, they may have been committed to each other, but they were not living in harmony with God's plan, ideal design, so at the end of 100 years you have nothing, there's nobody there. Everyone's died. If you do the exact same thing with 10 heterosexual couples and come back 100 years later, you have a thriving population. It's multiplied, it's grown in every different way. That's not bigotry or hatred to say that, it's simply to say that God's ways are best. The problem is, the moment we start to talk about this, when we talk about gay issues or trans issues, somebody's gonna get hurt. I mean, maybe you're here today and you struggle with same-sex attraction, and if you don't hear words of affirmation and encouragement, and hey, God made you this way, or, or hey, we've been misunderstanding the Bible and there's really a place for you and, and, you, and you can be with, with someone of the same sex and God will bless that, you'll feel condemned or hurt, but we have to speak the truth. If we see things happening in the society around us, we feel we need to speak up, but when we speak up, we're gonna hurt someone struggling. Maybe your, your four-year-old kid is struggling with gender identity and you think, hey, we raised, we raised him the same as we raised our other kids. And now he's, it's not because he's a gay activist or a transgender activist. And, and, and when we're talking about laws and society and bring these things up, then, then, then that family feels, don't you care about me? Well, my kid. So often what happens in the church is we just don't talk about these things. It's too controversial. Here, here the, the moment you address these issues and say anything firm, you're going to be attacked you're gonna, be, you're gonna be blasted, you're gonna be spoken against, so all your good reputation, the community, now you're in the midst of controversy, why not just avoid issues? Well, well the reason we can't avoid issues is because we live in this world, and, and in this world, there are all types of difficult things that everyone's being exposed to from children on up, and, and we can't avoid dealing with these things because people right here in our midst, family members, friends, are struggling with these very things. You get invited to a same-sex wedding. You know, your, your brother's getting, quote, married to his partner. He wants you to go, what should you do as a Christian? What's the right way to show love? What happens if your 15-year-old says, Mom, I think I'm a lesbian? How, how do you respond to these things? So, so we have a pastoral obligation. We have a social obligation. And then Jesus called us to be salt and light. He called us to make a difference in this world. Martin Luther King once said the church must be reminded it's, it's not the master of the state or the servant of the state, but the conscience of the state. So we are the ones that have to bring clarity. If not, the whole society collapses around us. So what I want to do for the rest of this first service is really emphasize why it is that we have to take stands, why it is that, that we must speak with clarity, and tonight, we're gonna have just Q&A. You come with your questions, and we'll spend the entire time answering as many questions. And if you're here, and you don't think I'm being fair, or if you're watching online and really differ with me, please, by all means, come and raise your questions, and we'll talk honestly. So, my own calling in 2004, God called me to begin to address issues of homosexuality. And, and the words that I heard as they formed came together in early 2005 while fasting in DC. Reach out and resist. During prayer and fasting in front of the Supreme Court, I heard these words clearly in, in my inner ear. Reach out and resist. Reach out to the people with compassion. Resist the agenda with courage. So I'm thinking, Lord, why me? Now, I don't mind controversy. That wasn't, I'm, I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus. I got saved into controversy. I don't think I've known a day in my life as a believer that hasn't been filled with controversy. And, and even someone will call my radio show and ask me a question, and I'll answer innocently, not knowing that that's like the big controversy on the internet, and I'm just getting blasted. So there, there's not a second that goes by, literally online, where someone's not attacking me or accusing me of something. I don't mind the controversy. But I'm thinking, okay, my PhD is in Near Eastern languages and literatures. Are we going to have a discussion of what, what the ancient Babylonians believed? I mean, how does that tie in with, with these cultural issues? And then I don't come out of homosexuality. I got saved as, as a heroin shooting LSD using hippie rock drummer. I've got that testimony. <laughs> come on, there's an old enough crowd here. You understand the saying if you remember. 
Well, no, if you, re if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. <laughs> so, I have that testimony. I'm Jewish, I have that testimony. But I began to understand that this is going to be the issue in the church in this generation. And that already gay activism was the principal threat to freedom of religion, speech, and conscience. The, the problem was I, I had this strong burden to stand against what was happening in the society, but I knew to have God's heart, I needed, I needed to care for the people. You know, it's been said that if you talk to my generation and say the word homosexuality, you think an issue. If you speak to the younger generation, you think a person. And it's both. It's, it's people and it's issues. So I, I began to seek the Lord earnestly for his heart and asked him to break my heart with the things that broke his heart. And I would make appointments just to sit with local gay activists and to talk, share your story, tell me your perspective. What do you feel the way you do? How do you view people like me? Sometimes I'd sit, just tears streaming down my cheeks, listening to, to people share their, their heart and their rejection and, and how they felt the church hated them and God hated them. So my heart broke at the same time and it continues to break to this day out of care and love for people. At the same time, I realized this is the issue that we must address and no one gets to sit this out. So here's what I wrote in 2011 in my book, A Queer Thing Happened to America, but, but I, I began saying this early on. First, gay activists came out of the closet. Second, they demanded their rights. Third, they demanded that everyone recognize those rights. Fourth, they want to strip away the rights of those who oppose them. Fifth, they want to put those who oppose their rights into the closet. I began to say early on, those who came out of the closet want to put us in the closet. And people mocked me and I'd be on secular radio or TV and nobody wants to put you in the closet. And then after a few years, I noticed it shift and people began to say to me, bigots like you belong in the closet. Here's what I wrote in 2011. From here on, embracing diversity refers to embracing all kinds of sexual orientation, homosexual expression, and gender identification, but rejects every kind of religious or moral conviction that does not embrace these orientations, expressions, and identifications. From here on, tolerance refers to the complete acceptance of LGBT lifestyles and ideology in the family, in the workplace, in education, in media, in religion, while at the same time refusing to tolerate any view that is contrary. From here on, inclusion refers to working with, supporting, sponsoring, and encouraging gay events, gay goals, while at the same time systematically refusing to work with and excluding anyone who is not in harmony with these events and goals. I, I remember speaking to a, a local company and they were supporting a gay pride event in the city and I said, you know, it's really very divisive in the city. Why don't you just stay neutral on this? They said, no, no, we want to stand in solidarity with the whole community. I said, well, we're having this Christian event we were celebrating marriage and family and the sanctity of life beginning in the womb. Would you sponsor that? They wrote back to me. They said, no, we will not work with you because we're inclusive. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is the, the double speak, everything changing. This is, this is 10 years ago I wrote this, but I was saying it for years before this. From here on, hate refers to any attitude, thought, or word that differs with the gay agenda. While gays are virtually exempt from the charge of hate speech, no matter how vile and incendiary the rhetoric, since they are always the perceived victims and never the victimizers. I wrote this in 2011. Children in elementary schools will be exposed to the rightness and complete normality of homosexuality, bisexuality, and transgender expression. Witness highly praised academic books such as The Queering of Elementary Education. And opposing views will be branded as dangerous and homophobic to be silenced and excluded from the classroom. Middle schools, high schools, and colleges will go out of their way to encourage both the celebration of homosexuality and deep solidarity with gay activism. The federal and state governments will legalize same-sex marriages, meaning that all heterosexuals must accept the legality of these marriages, then anyone refusing to do so could be prosecuted for discriminatory behavior. Corporate America will embrace every aspect of non-heterosexuality, including bisexuality, transgender, and beyond, calling for the dismissal 
of those who refuse to follow suit. And religious groups will no longer be allowed to view homosexual practice as immoral, branding such opposition as hate speech. So in other words, everything that we've been living out all these years, we saw coming. It's no surprise. I used to tell people, when they say, Mike, why are you addressing these issues? I mean, this is outside your calling. And bear in mind, we're still doing everything we're doing, training students in our ministry school, preaching around the world, doing Jewish outreach, writing books on all kinds of other subjects. But this became part of the calling. And I tell people, I feel like an umbrella salesman in the desert. And people say, Mike, why, why all these umbrellas? Dr. Brown, what's, what's all these warehouses with, with more and more umbrellas? And I tell them, storm is coming and you're gonna need the umbrellas. And then of course, once the storm began to hit more and more, we couldn't make umbrellas fast enough, so to say. So, so here's where we stand right now. The Equality Act is being pushed. It is something that the current administration really wants to get through. If the Equality Act becomes law, as summarized by Liberty Council, it will force churches, mosques, and synagogues to either promote LGBT activities or face devastating court fees and bankruptcy. In other words, if you use this building or any building in your facility to, to perform marriages, then you would legally have to perform same-sex marriages in the facility or else. Destroy gender privacy in every bathroom, locker room, and shower outside your private home. It's not exaggerated. Force all Christian organizations, businesses, and schools to hire transgenders. So you have a Christian preschool, a man, obviously a biological man, comes wearing a dress, saying, hey, my name is Sally, I'd like to teach at your preschool. You would not allow, be allowed to say, sorry, that, that would violate our ethic. You would not be allowed to do that as a Christian school. Silence those wanting to be freed from same-sex attractions or behavior. This could even lead to banning portions of the Bible because it offers the power to free people desiring to change or overcome unwanted LGBTQ attractions or behavior enact many other bigoted directives that would effectively criminalize Christianity in America, and there are zero religious exemptions in this bill. It explicitly says no religious exemptions. This could potentially pass unless enough lawmakers stand up for what's right. I mean, it's actually something that is being discussed and is being pushed. How do we not speak up Yes, by all means, show care, compassion, love for everyone, whoever they are, whatever their background. And whoever walks in this building, let them be flooded with the love and goodness of God and love from your hearts. But Jesus comes, John 1, full of grace and truth. Not grace or truth, but grace and truth. And sometimes we come with a wonderful emphasis on grace, but in a way that goes too far and waters down the gospel and brings no requirements and no responsibility. It's the all about me gospel. And, and then other times we go to the other extreme and, and we speak the truth so loudly and clearly that there's, there's no compassion, there's no mercy, there's no help for the hurting. Grace and truth, we live with a certain holy tension. Dear friend Larry Tomczak pointed this out to me yesterday. Intercessors for America sent out a prayer letter in middle schools in Virginia. The urinals are coming down. Dave Kubal wrote this. I can't believe I just typed those words as the first five words of an article I'm writing. In our local middle school in the small Virginia town where Intercessors for America is located, contractors are removing all the urinals from the men's bathrooms. Why? Because supposedly there are too many men without male genitalia who are offended by urinals. And to make matters even worse, the signs on the bathroom doors denoting male or female will be taken down. This is moral madness. What you're saying is say an 11 or 12 year old girl who identifies as a boy is not gonna be using the boy's bathroom, but because she is offended by the presence of a urinal, the urinal should be removed. That kid needs help. That, that kid needs real love and help and, 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 and folks getting with the family to find out the root of why that kid is struggling the way they are. They do not need affirmation in something that is not real. Love tells the truth. Love has to tell the truth. 
And, and if this child was actually a male, the child would not be offended by the presence of a urinal. But in these days in which we live, perception has taken the place of reality. And everything has become relative. So let me just play a little clip from the documentary In His Image. I really strongly encourage you to watch the whole documentary. It's free online, In His Image dot movie. Or on YouTube, In His Image, the movie, you'll find it there. It's free to watch. I hosted it for the American Family Association, American Family Studios. It's compassionate. They're amazing stories of transformation, ex-gay, ex-trans stories, moving stories. There's a lot of good theology, but we talk about what's happening in the culture as well. Let's just take a quick look. You wanna be a drag queen and your parents don't let you? You need new parents. I'm a man. My ID say female and he's being rude. Know your pronoun. Know your pronoun. It is me. L-G-G-B-D-T-T-T-I-Q-Q. My two mom. The hips on the drag thing go swish, swish, swish. The issues are unavoidable. They're on the news. I did not have a chance to comment on how good the White House looked in rainbow colors. They're in our legislation. The Texas bathroom bill. In our schools. Drag queen story hour. Our entertainment, our social media. They're even reaching into our churches. Let us be the church together. They're causing families to question everything they thought they knew. I was being asked to choose my child and my church. I chose my child. And they're pushing everyone who calls themselves a follower of Christ to wrestle with the question, what does God think about all this? So again, we come to this fundamental reality that when we depart from God's order, think of Genesis 1, everything reproduces after its own kind. So you watch the trajectory. We talked about this more on Friday night with the young adults. Watch the trajectory. Watch where something leads over a period of time. Something that seems like a tiny, small, bad habit, if practiced over and over and over, often becomes an addiction. Something that seems innocent in itself, if it's a little bit off, those of you that, that were marksmen shooting or with arrows, if your trajectory is just a little bit off, you start slightly off target and you end up way off. Back in the 80s, there was a Korean airliner that ended up getting shot down over Russian airspace. Over 250 people died. There were American congressmen on board. It was, it was a real tragedy. And they claimed there was no response. Russians claimed there was no response to warnings, so they shot it down. In point of fact, it just, it went off the trajectory. Somehow, the, the Pilot error or computer error, it went slightly off course, but after a while, it ended up in, in a fatal zone. In Genesis 1, God plants in the earth these seed-bearing plants, and they reproduce after the kind. So orange trees reproduce oranges, and apple trees, apples, and cats give birth to cats, and dogs give birth to dogs. That's the way it works. Where does something go? When you deviate from the norm, what else comes in its wake? I wrote this poem, published it in 2011, called, Here at School, the Slant is Gay. Little Johnny went to school there to learn a brand new rule. No longer could the boys be boys or have their special trucks and toys. Only six so young and tender, it's time for him to unlearn gender and break the binding two-sex mold, that hurtful thinking that's so old. Parents at home can have their say, but here at school, the slant is gay. In other words, to make this clear, there's nothing wrong with being queer. Having two moms is mighty fine to disagree is out of line. We'll deconstruct the family and smash religious bigotry and keep the church out of the state by saying faith is really hate. Free speech can only go one way since here at school the slant is gay. So little ones, it's time to learn about famous queers, each one in turn. Lesbian greats long neglected, well-known gays just now detect it. Some perhaps were man-boy lovers. We'll keep that stuff under the covers. Glisten, Gay Lesbian Straight Education Network. Glisten will fill in for granny and help kids find their inner tranny. Those born in a body that's wrong will hear of sex change before long. And through the years as Johnny grows, he will learn that anything goes with Bill who's trans and Joe who's bi and Sue who thinks that she's a guy. 
United in the Day of Silence, joining the Gay-Straight Alliance, the queer new system rules the day, since here at school, the slant is gay. I spoke one night, among many other speakers, at a local school board meeting as they talked about changing things, bathroom rules, gender issues, transgender issues. And I had with me in my possession what was called the Glisten School Box, second edition. Glisten, again, being the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network. And the founder of Glisten served as, as a major education czar in the Obama administration, gay activist teacher. And, and in this, I, I had curriculum that was being used in schools, put out by Glisten. I, I, was, I was standing, speaking to the board, talking about some of the exercises that were in this, that, that led to that poem. I mean, there was one helping elementary school kids find their inner transgender identity, their inner tranny. Maybe you're really not a boy on the inside. Maybe you're really not a girl. You should question that. Come on, you remember being six, seven years old? Boys like girls, no, boys like boys. You know, it's like, you got the cooties. And you don't understand sexuality. And all these things are being planted. And I said to the board, this is where this goes. And they said, no one is teaching that anywhere. They said, you do not have that. I, said, I have it right here. It was literally in my hands. No, you don't. They thought I was just making it up. So lest you think I'm exaggerating, lest you think I'm getting all worked up over nothing because maybe your school district's more conservative, check out this video. Just, I saw it posted a couple days ago from this very excited preschool teacher. Check this out. Story time. This has been my first year in preschool with a class of my own, teaching alongside another queer neurodivergent educator, and we have been rocking our twos class. We've been talking about gender and skin color and consent and empathy and our bodies and autonomy. It's been fabulous. But our teaching team is shifting and a new person is being onboarded, someone with many years of experience. So today at the lunch table, when the topic of gender and genitals came up, one of our students plainly looked up and said, well, I'm a girl today, but I know that teacher Ko isn't. No, they're Envy. And the look on the incoming teacher's face was priceless. She was shocked in a good way. And she just looked around at the two of us and said, this class is incredible. And I am so impressed. That's what you call child abuse. And that's happening in schools across America. And the parents don't have a clue. This is why we've been shouting and sounding the alarm for years. You have to understand the moment you do, you get blacklisted. Southern Poverty Law Center, which had a lot of influence, has been waning. They identify hate groups, so neo-Nazi groups and KKK and radical this and radical that, white supremacists. A few years back, they wrote an article, 30 leaders of the new radical right you know, David Duke, former Grand Wizard of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, he was on the list. And Malik Zulu Shabazz, who was the head of the New Black Panthers, he was on the list. And some neo-Nazi skinheads. And me. <laughs> I was on the list. I've gone to give talks at college campuses and their protests the day before. We have to have police protection to do them. And they'll say, yeah, th th he's a hate leader. Now, again, it's for the gospel, it's for the truth, so be it. I don't, I don't mind that, but you get blacklisted there. Glad the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, which I, I nicknamed as the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Disagreement, as you'll see why, they put out called the Commentator Accountability Project, and they started with 36 conservative commentators, and then they expanded the number. But I was on the initial 36, and they got it out to all the networks all the major networks saying, do not have these people on your shows to give their viewpoint. Do not allow their viewpoint to be aired. There are places we go to speak and can't have me in because there's too much controversy. I mean, I've, I've had well-known Christian leaders say, I, I'd love to endorse your book, but I can't because it would associate me with these other things. Now, again, I don't, mind, I don't mind this. I'm not in this for fame or being popular. But the point is, we, we have a moral obligation to the children, 
to the grandchildren, the great children, we have a moral obligation to speak and to act and to stand. And it's not a matter of, is it convenient? It's not a matter of what's gonna happen to me. It's a matter of what's gonna happen to children if we don't. That's the question. And you may have not caught that one line where the, the little girl, the, the child, I'm a girl today, so the idea you can just change, because that's a common thing, how I feel at the moment. And I've read interviews of kids, of, depending on the event, how they feel, male, female, or, or NB, non-binary. So the teacher's non-binary. What does a, four, a preschooler understand about gender binary? Zero. Do you think it's a coincidence that so many kids now are growing up confused about their gender identity? I mean, you have superheroes that go from male to female. You've got all these kinds of things happening and little impressionable kids are exposed. And, and, and suddenly something's happened with the younger generation, Gen Z, where there is a, a total spike in Gallup polls of how many identify as bisexual. I'm talking about you're here, you're here, you're here for decades. Boom, this total spot. Where did that come from? And a lot of this has happened, let me be frank, because the church has been silent. The church has been largely silent. Even churches like this, influential churches that will have me come in and speak on these things. I speak on many others, but will say speak on this or pastor to speak on this. It's exceedingly rare. And, and even as we'll, we'll emphasize, especially in the second the second half of the, uh, of, of the message later on, e even simply on a pastoral level, put aside the schools, put aside what's happening in society around us, just on a pastoral level, we owe it to our flock because people are hurting. And, and you wanna know what parents are teaching their kids? Check out this video. A is for ally. B is for bye. C is for coming out. D is for drag. E is for equality. F is for family. Uh oh, we missed a page. G is for gay. H is for hope. I is for intersex. J is for joy. K is for kiki. L is for lesbian. M is for mountain. N is for non-binary. O is for orientation. Very good. P is for hands. Q is for I don't know what Q. That's okay. Q is for queer. Queer. R is for respect. S is for sachet. Sachet. T is for trans. Very good. U is for unique. V is for vogue. Do you know how to vogue? Yeah. You do? Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty good. Okay, turn the page. W is for wonder. X is for X. Mm -hmm. Y is for U. And Z is for Zans. Zest. Zest. The end. The end. What was the name of this book? The Gay BCs. <laughs> you like this book? Yes. Are you a woke toddler? Yes. Can you say, I'm woke? I'm woke. <laughs> Friends, this is why we've been sounding the alarm and speaking out. That's why I wrote the poem that I wrote, say this is the new reality. And of course, from the mom's perspective, she's being enlightened and helping her kid be raised 
in a way that's tolerant and diverse. What this is is utterly destructive. You know, P stands for pan. What's pan? Pansexual, attracted to anyone of any sexual orientation. S for sachet, and you're teaching that to a little child. And how about drag queen reading hour? You know, this is enthusiastically endorsed by the American Library Association. It's becoming an increasingly common phenomenon in different states, even in different countries. And that's not a doctored picture. That's talking about revealing things the way they are. One guy was a gay guy, drag queen, publicly got up because there was a debate in the local city council about having the event. He said, yes, we want to groom the children. He didn't mean to seduce them sexually, but to embrace homosexuality. As we said, we want to groom the children. Already 2001, Richard Na John Newhouse could write, the transgender revolution is the latest political cause being promoted by those of heightened consciousness. Columnist John Leo notes that San Francisco now pays for city employees who want sex change operations, and a number of television shows, television shows are in the works portraying the joys of transgendered liberation. The Los Angeles Times had a sympathetic story on a husband and wife who are both having the operation. They will stay married, but the husband will become the wife and vice versa. We actually know someone, know the gal since she was a little girl. Married, then came out as a lesbian with the husband and then with a guy, and now they're switching roles. She probably by now has become the man and he the woman. And again, this was 2001 this was written. You think, what have we been doing during this time? What would have happened if we had been more on the alert and more proactive in positive ways and more compassionate in our outreach? That's why I wrote in 2011 the tragic flight path of KL, KL007 initially veered just 5.9 miles off course. Then I go on with that. What happened ultimately? How far have we already deviated from the path where would this current trajectory take us if our college kids can describe themselves as genderqueer dykes and transgender gay males? What's coming next? How about the trans child? How about queer in the crib? And again, I wrote this in 2011. According to the 1970 Gay Revolution Party Manifesto, gay revolution will not produce a world in which women will receive equal pay for work traditionally assigned to their gender, nor in which they'll become equal partners in the nuclear family. Rather, it will mean that biological sex will have nothing to do with occupation and that there will be no families. Gay revolution will not lead to freedom and association for gay people in a predominantly straight world, nor will it lead to straight-defined homosexuality with marriages and exclusive monogamy. Gay revolution will produce a world in which all social and sensual relationships will be gay and in which homo and heterosexuality will be incomprehensible terms. Professor Barb Burge, Manchester University, 2007. She believes that transgendered individuals, which include a whole range of individuals, should be affirmed and considered to be gender variant, not suffering from gender identity disorders. These individuals include bi-genders, gender radicals, butch lesbians, cross-dressing married men, transvestites, intersex individuals, transsexuals, drag queens, kings and queens, gender blenders, queers, gender queens, two spirits, or he she's. So now, you can go to websites and just get all the, the data from God created us male and female to this. These are the primary categories of people who believe they have multiple gender identities. Amber gender, bi gender, blur gender, call gender, conflict gender, cosmic gender, Christian gender, de goes on and on, you see. Gender vex, gyra gender, libra gender, ugly gender, pan gender, poly gender, tri gender. This is, if you have multiple identities at once, these people need help. I don't read this to mock because people take this seriously. I read this to say, this is what happens when you deviate from the design. This is the trajectory. Male and female, he created them. Multiply that a trillion times over and you have new generations of male and female, new generations of families, new generations of kids joined to mother and father. Deviate from the path. No matter how much people love each other, no matter how much they say I was born this way, no matter how much they say this is who I really am, deviate from the path and you end up with this. Or, and I'll, I'll bring this to a close very shortly, I went to some college websites where they're talking about preferred gender pronouns. You'll see, you, know, you may be looking on Twitter and you see someone's bio and it's the person's name and then it's he, she, 
or they, them. It's like, what does that mean? That means if you refer to them in the third person, here's a woman, but she prefers to be referred to as they or something else. Does want to fit in the gender binary. So here's one list. I'm, I'm not making this up. From he and she, right, you now have they, them, their, themselves. So instead of he, himself, right, te, tem, ter, temself, thon, thons, thon self. How about, keep going, fe, fair, fairs, fair self, ve, veres, veres, veres self, ni, nim, niz, nim self. Keep going, z, zer, z, zer self, zed, zed, zed self. Z, next, z, zim, zim, z, 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 hard to, I'm having a hard time here. Okay, let's go to the last one. V, viz, ver, versa, g, gem, kai, kir, kai, kursa, bun, 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 self. And you have to, this is taken with the utmost seriousness. I read this thing, God help these people. What in the world is going on? But when perception becomes reality, why not? Anything goes. They're Harvard University. Despite its reputation as a bastion of the establishment, the Kennedy School, followed the student's lead, agreed to provide clear plastic stickers this semester with four pronoun options that students could apply to their name cards. He, him, she, her, they, them, and Z, her. So they gave in. They said, okay, well, so this is, and if you don't go along with this, you are now the bigot. There's something wrong with you. As I said at the outset, those who came out of the closet want to put us in the closet. So where does it leave us? It leaves us with a certain tension that we must get involved in our schools. We must stand in our places of business. Someone asked me a question Friday night when he was in a certain corporate setting. There was pressure under him. You conform and do this or else. One of my colleagues, computer programmer with Bank of America, told me some years ago, he said, they're pushing us out. Right in Charlotte, where it's based, one of the biggest banks in the world. He said, they're pushing us out. He said, first, they would ask for your identity, you know, if you're straight, gay, whatever. They just, in your bio, they'd be asking this. He said, but, because they didn't get enough responses. He said, they, they now had, are you an ally, an LGBT, so are you gay or are you our LGBT ally, or trans or a trans ally? And it would come up on your, anyone working in the company could pull up your data. So you're basically being, you're either in or out. And ultimately, they pushed him out because he stood where he was, who he was, and it got in the way of his job opportunity. He was pushed out. I have other friends lost jobs simply because in their private lives, they held to certain convictions, and when that became known, they were out. So we must stand. We must do what's right. We must pray for government leaders. We must elect people that share our moral values get involved in our schools, get involved in school boards. We do all this. We teach, we train actively, righteously. That's part of what we must do. Resist the agenda. And find out, maybe your kid's not in the most conservative school district. Maybe things are a little different than you expect in terms of where things are going. Find out, sit, talk. But at the same time, God cares about people. The, the people pushing the, the agenda, they think they're doing it for good reasons. They think they're saving lives. They think it's about equality. So our hearts have to break for them. Jesus died for gay and straight with the same blood. He died for every human being the same blood. Every one of us is created in the image of God and yet fallen. So we must have God's heart of compassion and realizing that if we really care we bring people to God's ways because God's ways are best. And that living a holy life ultimately means living a life in conformity with the standards of God. Even if our own feelings or emotions go in a different direction, Jesus said, if you want to come after me, you must deny yourself, take up the cross and follow me. So wherever you find yourself, whatever's going on in your life, you say, Lord, here I am. I want to follow you. I'm struggling. I'm hurting. I've got questions but I want to follow you, and my friend, he will give you grace, and Jesus will be more than enough. Amen? Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Lord. Uh, we want you to know that we love you and care for you deeply. And so if anything that we talked about this morning, if that hits you at home, right here, we want you to know as a pastoral staff and with our network and partners in the community, you have an open door. And, uh, and, and we want to talk to you, we wanna love on you, we want Jesus for your life. And uh, with no judgment, our doors are open, amen? Amen. amen. I wanna remind you that Dr. Brown will be signing books and his books are for sale just past the fellowship hall in the GCA hallway, uh, so just this way. And then again, tonight at 6.30 p.m. right here, uh, we will be having a question and answer. So, as it goes with the question and answer, don't forget that message two, a continuation of what took place this morning, Dr. Brown will be doing a second service and we gotta make room for second service. So we hope that you would watch it online and do all of that, right? Because the crowd's coming. We just change it over in that parking lot. So check that out. Come tonight, ask questions. Uh, and, and remember, Dr. Brown said, if you disagree, bring in a form of a question. He'd love to talk to you about that. Amen? Amen? Would you stand to your feet? Let's pray. I think that's a good thing today as we go out. So Father, I thank you so much for the family of God. And I thank you for your ways. I thank you that you love every person abundantly. And so God, as your church, God, we need you. We ask you to fill us with hope and compassion that we could be Jesus as we walk out of here in his ways, impacting and affecting, making a difference in our world with the grace and love and the truth of Jesus Christ. Bless your children as they go today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Have a good week, y'all. God bless you.